you very much. And let me also extend my welcome to everyone to this forum, strengthening the direct care workforce post COVID, scaling up and sustaining effective strategies. Um, I want to thank you for your patience uh, with our last minute change in webinar platforms. In a way, it's kind of a metaphor for this last year. We all had to adapt and uh, be quick on our feet to respond to just about anything that came up. And you'll hear a lot about that during the conversation today. My name is Deborah Lipson. I'm a senior fellow at Mathematica, and I have the great privilege of serving as the moderator for today's event. This forum is brought to you by Mathematica, a nonpartisan research organization and presented by the Center for Studying Disability Policy, which conducts research and evaluation of policies and strategies designed to improve the lives of people with disabilities. During today's forum, we're going to start with some brief background on the direct care workforce, just to set the stage for today's discussion. I think many of the folks on this call are well aware of many of the issues, but we want to make sure we're all starting from the same page here. Uh, we'll then move into our panel discussion and leaving time for questions from participants. As Derek had said, uh, if you have questions, go put them in the uh, Q&A box in the lower right part of your screen. Let me uh, now introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, these are some of the best experts in the country, and they have both diverse perspectives as well as decades of experience. Um, it's, so they are well equipped uh, to discuss a lot of different strategies and policies for strengthening the direct care workforce, particularly in the wake of the pandemic. First, Robin Stone. Is Senior Vice President for Research at Leading Age and Co-Director of the Leading Age LTSS Center at UMass Boston. She's a widely recognized authority on long-term care and aging policy and has been engaged in policy development, program evaluation, large-scale demonstrations, and applied research in this arena for over 40 years. Next, B. Rector is Director of Home and Community Services Division in the Aging and Long-Term Support Administration for Washington State's Department of Social and Health Services. B has worked in long-term services and supports at the state level for more than 20 years and is well known as a national leader in this field. Zulman Torres is a home health aide for Cooperative Healthcare Associates in New York City, where she has worked for about 23 years. She provides direct care, for her clients and assists with their activities of daily living. She's also worked in CHCA's home office and has served as a translator at a nursing home. Last, Robert Espinosa is Vice President of Policy at PHI, where he oversees national policy advocacy, research, and public education in support of the direct care workforce. Uh, please see their bios in the webinar materials for more information about their backgrounds. Now, let me, before we enter our panel discussion, um, I'd like to give you just a, a little bit of uh, stage setting background here. Um, there have been, the direct care workforce has faced some, a number of longstanding challenges going back 20, 30 or more years. Um, and let me be clear that the direct care workforce that we're talking about today includes home health aides, personal care workers, and direct support professionals um, who provide hands on care and personal support for frail elderly uh, and people with disabilities. Well before the COVID pandemic, the direct care workforce faced the challenges that you see on this screen um, and the public health emergency both exposed and in some cases exacerbated many of these issues. Among them, too few workers to meet the need combined with high rates of turnover, low wages and benefits, inadequate training and lack of career letters, <laughs> and very demanding schedules and difficult. This is difficult work physically and emotionally. With regard to the shortages, uh, even before the COVID pandemic began, there were not enough people to fill all the available positions. And the demand for home care workers is expected to grow by more than 568,000 on average each year over the next decade. That's 34% more than those uh, who are currently employed in these jobs. 
it's a higher rate of growth than the types of direct than uh, all direct care workers, um, including those who work in nursing homes and other institutions, shown on the second bar in this slide, and many times higher than the average for all occupations. The people who comprise home, the home care workforce are, for the most part, women of color. More than 60% are African American, Hispanic or Latino, Asian American, and other non white races and ethnicities. Nearly nine in 10 home care workers are women, and a third are ages 55 and older. Home care worker wages and benefits are both. Very, very low over the last 10 years, median wages increased from about $11 per hour to about $12 per hour. They're a little bit closer now to 13 per hour, but still that's less than a dollar or so higher when adjusted for inflation. And in many parts of the country that is below the living wage, which is defined as the level of needed for uh, workers to earn enough at a full time job to afford minimum standards of living and to support themselves and their families. Low pay combined with difficult working conditions also leads to high rates of turnover and chronic short staffing shortages, and that in turn contributes to low quality care. Turnover can also reduce the ability of home care workers to advance in their career. On the benefit side of the equation, about one in every six home care workers lack any type of health insurance. It's higher than it used to be at 84%, but that still leaves a lot of people without any health insurance whatsoever. On this slide, you'll also see that about two of every five home care workers have family income levels that qualify them for Medicaid or Medicare uh, uh, public insurance programs in their state. As I mentioned before, COVID introduced new challenges to the direct care workforce. Although most of the headlines in the last year focused on nursing home workers, those who provide care in homes and community residential settings faced extraordinary pressure as well. One of the most stressful issues that they faced was the risk and the fear of contracting or spreading the virus, particularly early in the epidemic when there were acute shortages of personal protective equipment. Some workers had to take time off due to illness or childcare obligations, and those who picked up the slack suffered from burnout. When training programs were halted or moved online, those courses were less effective in many cases or inaccessible even to those without the right technology or had slow internet connections. I wanna emphasize that for most of these challenges, there are evidence-based solutions. Robin and I worked together more than 15 years ago on the Better Jobs, Better Care initiative, which supported research and demonstrations to test various strategies. The studies that resulted from that effort identified a number of very effective approaches, including innovative recruitment strategies, uh, targeted wage and benefit improvements, and better training and career ladders. But most of these solutions have not been scaled up or sustained with dedicated funding and resources. There are new and very exciting federal funding opportunities that were just recently announced, which we're going to be talking about later, that can help make critical and, some would say, long overdue investments in the direct care workforce. With that background, let me now turn to our panel discussion. First, let's talk about the challenges that COVID created for home care workers. And, and really the question here is, did the COVID pandemic really worsen these problems? Um, and if so, how? I, I'd like to start this part of the discussion um, with Robert Espinosa, a policy analyst and advocate for workers. And then we're gonna follow Robert uh, with Zulma, Robin, and then B. So Robert, how would you see the COVID pandemic affecting the problems that have been facing this workforce? Yeah, thank you, Deborah, and, and hello to all my fellow panelists and all the participants. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a profound impact on the direct care workforce from the very beginning. I mean, these workers are the paid frontline of support for millions of older adults and people with disabilities. 
who were at high risk of COVID-19 and of the serious complications in general. Um, some of the points I would make are that, you know, we did see through research that the direct care workforce contracted by about 280,000 workers within the first three months. Um, this tells you that workers were often being forced to make the impossible choice of, do I go to work and get sick and risk infecting my families, my clients, et cetera, and then, you know, without the paid leave or the paid sick days to be able to recover from um, that, that virus. Um, also, or do I make the choice of staying home and collapsing financially, right, in jobs that make a median wage of about $12 an hour? Um, because of this, many workers left the sector, um, and I think it became more difficult to recruit workers as well. Um, we know that this would, that there is a psychological effect on the workforce as well, and many workers often lacked brief support or bereavement leave. And while the work for the, the pandemic elevated the visibility in some ways of the direct care workforce, it didn't do it at the level they deserve. I mean, we know that these workers are essential. They were deemed essential by all states, um, but they weren't necessarily always included in mainstream telethons or in the political discourse around the pandemic or the workforce. And certainly as we emerge from this crisis, I think it's gonna be essential that we continue to draw attention to who these workers are, why they're so valuable, the challenges they face, and the solutions that we need to explore. Um, it's been a, a learning experience, but it's it's one that will continue um, as we think about the sector. All right, thank you. Zulma, can you share a little bit of your experience working as a home care worker during the COVID pandemic? How did it affect your job and how did it affect you and your family? Hi to all. Yes, well, it, it did affect us, like it affected everyone else. It was scary, very, not knowing what's happening, but as a, Home Health Aid, I was determined to continue, to continue working with my clients because I know they needed me. Um, I protected myself. I followed every protocol I had to. I also brought it home as well. And um, traveling in the Metro North as well, all of that made it scary. But I thank God I was able to do it and I continue doing it today. I'm happy that I'm able to do it and, and I feel that the best feeling in the world is to feel needed as a home health aide because we're on the bottom of the list. <laughs> but we're so essential. And unfortunately, we have this COVID-19 happening right now. But now, finally, someone wants to hear us. And that's a good thing. That's an awesome thing for me right now. And I'll continue doing my job the best that I can. And I had a team at work that we all understood. And we protected one another the same way we protected our client. And we took it home once again. My family was very worried, but I kept saying, it's okay, I can do this. And I have continued. And I'll continue protecting myself until we find out what's actually happening. But going forward, I just feel that um, I wanna be known, not only for me as a home health aide, for every home health aide that we out there working, that they could acknowledge us and bring better pay, more programming. It's so much more to what we do. We're not only in someone else's home, we're actually there providing a service, helping them, and they need us. And it's such a good feeling to know, fine, I'm in someone else's home, but that person needs me. And to see the smile in their face is my accomplishment. Besides them having to be in a hospital, in a nursing home, they're more comfortable within their home. So seeing that, I'm actually happy to say that I'm a home health aide today. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Zoma. That's thank that's we thank you for your service too, thank Robin. You so from the vantage point of providers, home home care providers and employers, I'm wondering if you can tell uh -huh. us a little bit about what you saw in terms of the pandemic affecting the workforce. Sure, um, <clears throat> and I want to thank Zoma so much for her work. I think we need the voices of the of the front line to to illuminate the challenges as well as the incredible opportunities that, you know, in the face of all of this, people are rising to the occasion. Um, I think the issue for home care was almost a double whammy because you, you actually have two challenges, one of which was the fear of COVID on the part of the workers themselves and the fear of going into people's homes, mm -hmm. but also particularly in the beginning stages of this, uh, this, a pandemic, there was a, a a decrease in demand. So agencies were, families were saying, we don't want people coming into my relative's home. 
And so you had this challenge of workers who didn't want to go into the home or were afraid and had inadequate PPE and other types of um, protections to actually ensure their safety. And then you also had less demand, so you had less jobs to actually send people out to. And um, so this creates, you know, a challenge for the employers. It created a bigger challenge for the workforce who actually, on one hand, need the jobs because they're depending on them. Many of this workforce have two or more jobs that they're doing. Mm. And at the same time, they were afraid to go in. The other thing that I would say is, is that we did a, a study with a subsample of leading age uh, providers who participate in, in an employer platform. And we had quite a few thousand workers on this in this database. And we asked a few COVID related questions for all of them. And what really turned out, one of the major reasons why people left their jobs had to do with the lack of preparation and the communication from the employers to the frontline workers of how to deal with these issues. It was really interesting. We thought it was going to be a lot of other things that made them leave, but this preparation and communication was so important. And I think it underscores the issues for home care workers that they are in individuals home. They don't have a structure. They don't have a work structure. Actually, home care cooperative may be one of the few places that really has a strong worker community around their workplace. But without this structure, it was really, really difficult to do good communication and good preparation. So um, I think that was another issue that the that the workers faced from not having employers be able to communicate as well. And then the third thing was a lot of the training programs shut down. Mm -hmm. So there were no real pipelines for training either. I mean, it influenced so many aspects of what provides the pipeline for this workforce the jobs for this workforce, and then the supports and uh, protection and, and all of the things that would minimize safe, minimize harm and, and maximize safety. So, um, and, and I think it was, I think it's really hard in home care. I mean, we focused a lot on the nursing home sector because it got so much attention, but the truth of the matter is, is the, the home care workplace is so much harder to manage. Mm -hmm. We aren't even talking about the consumer directed workforce, right. which I'm assuming that B will talk to speak to as well. But the challenges of the employer range from a really large agency to an individual consumer who's actually hiring his or her own worker. Right. Thank you, Robin. And that's a wonderful segue to be um, a state policymaker and program manager where much of the direct care workforce do, in fact, work uh, as consumer directed workers. B, you want to share your views a little bit about how you saw the pandemic play out um, and the, the problems that it created for the direct care workforce? Yeah, absolutely. As as many folks uh, know, Washington happened to be the first place that the pandemic hit and it hit a nursing home and very quickly moved across the community. Um, and, and I would agree, we have two distinct workforces working in the home. We have employees of home care agencies and those home care agencies needed accurate information and guidance for their workforce. Um, they needed training for their workforce. They needed PPE for their workforce. Um, and then we have 45,000 uh, self-directed workers who are employed by consumers, many of whom are family members of the person that they're caring for. Um, and the, the breadth of languages spoken in, in that population, um, 12 languages, there's actually more like 72 languages, but 12 of the languages cover about 91% of the population. So I would say, you know, the challenge of getting good, accurate, actionable information written for the audience of a home care worker and a home care consumer and getting that disseminated both out through the employer groups but also directly out to the homes of the self-directed workforce and the consumers who are employing them. Mm -hmm. We had all of the impacts that folks have talked about in terms of, you know, families being scared to receive services and have a worker come into the home and workers being very scared about delivering services and how to do that safely. 
Um, it did play out very differently in the self-directed workforce where 80% of the folks are family members of the person that they're caring for, and they were able to really shelter in place. Um, and, you know, with the right information around, you know, early on, it was just the distancing, the washing hands, right. you know, that was before even cloth face coverings were recommended. Um, you know, so, you know, for us, we do require training. We've had a training program in place since about 1995, but, but Robin is absolutely right. The training programs all closed down. The testing sites closed down and so finding a way to disseminate information without kind of the typical training opportunities to do that really meant that we had to quickly go online and then quickly you saw the digital divide of who had access to broadband and who could access online training and who couldn't so um you know i would say um the shortages um have always been here in home care, um, certainly exacerbated by the pandemic. And the result of that is really um, needing to educate folks about it's safe to come back to the workforce, um, but also it's safe to accept the care. Um, vaccinations certainly are helping that um, in, in a lot of ways. But um, right now it's the access to services and the fact that people are having to wait um, to enter services right. simply because of the shortage of the workforce. Right. Um, let me segue to the next question and, and continue with B, if that's all right. Um, just to talk a little bit about what specifically was done to support and assure the safety of direct care workforce so they could continue providing services. Uh, B, let, let me just continue where you left off there and then I'll ask Zulma, Robin and Robert just to talk a little bit about the response. Be sure. You know, that very first weekend was what guidance and information can we develop and can we disseminate out to home care agencies, but also to the direct care workforce. Um, so, you know, working with the public health department to understand the work of the home care workforce, which really was not something they were focused on. They were focused on the long term care facilities at that point in time. Okay. Um, so disseminating information, getting good training, um, getting it available, purchasing uh, personal protective equipment and learning how to do that, um, learning how to warehouse it. Uh, learning how to disseminate it. We created 30 day PPE kits that our self directed workforce can order um, COVID positive kits as well as non COVID positive kits. We're still disseminating that today. Okay. Um, we partnered with a labor union that um, that is represents our workforce um, and employers to disseminate those trainings um, around infection control, access to PPE, how to properly don and doff um, that PPE. We also created policy around services that could be provided remotely. Um, you know, we were hearing from workers that they were worried and clients also that they were worried. And so we really maximized what can be done remotely. Of course, home care really relies on person to person services for activities of daily living. But there were things like wellness checks, um, picking up laundry uh, without a lot of uh, contact with a client, um, picking up groceries, dropping it off, calling and doing medication reminders and queuing around personal hygiene. Uh, what we found is uh, is allowing that really um, provided an opportunity for clients who would have gone completely without services to actually accept some services and and to keep a connection so that we knew when there was a crisis brewing in a home. It also allowed some workers who had to be home to take care of their children, to do homeschooling, to remain in the workforce. Right. right. Zoma, I'm curious what kind of support you got from your employer or your union? Well, they gave us some PPE in the beginning. They uh -huh. set us up a little bit because everything was so hard to find then. And um, they will check on us, they will give us a call to see how we're feeling, if we're feeling okay, um, to make sure our client was okay. And to the day of today at seven o'clock, they will call me again and they'll check in on me. So that was pretty nice. And they had also nurses calling in on us to make sure we were okay and our clients as well. So the same way as home. 
everybody was concerned and we were checking in on one another. So I'm blessed to say that. So that really worked for all of us. And it's still working as, as it goes. Well, that's terrific. Yeah. Robin, how did home care agencies respond to the needs of their workers? Did, I mean, hazard pay we've heard about, temporary wage increases, meals even. What kinds of things yeah. happened that, like initially and what have continued? Yeah. So the first thing I want to say is that a lot of what B was, was talking about um, was an issue for the employers in the home care sector. Uh, they were, I would say, long-term care and long-term services and supports in general was a sort of what I call the bastard child of the healthcare sector in terms of being on the highest priority list for uh, pe for, for protective personal protective equipment, all of the other things. Finally, we got nursing homes on the radar screen, but then home health and home care were not on that radar screen. So they were sort of third level down. Um, so there were even more challenges, I think, with the employers, and again, in terms of being able to get the right training and get the materials to the aides themselves. One of the things that Leading Age did, we, we were running daily calls with all of our members and out and people who were not our members. We now have gone to one day a week, but we were doing it this daily where we would have updates on everything from how do you keep your the, the frontline staff safe to how do you start to get access to the federal dollars that may be um, coming down, which might help you to access supplies and things like that more quickly. Um, uh, how do you deal with various testing mechanisms, contact tracing, all of those kinds of things. So, I, you know, I think there was at least an effort at, at the association level to reach and because we actually serve of the full continuum of providers, right. we were able to get a, have access to a lot of these different kinds of employers. The employers themselves, though, I mean, we have some incredible examples of what what organizations would do both individually as well as collectively. We worked, for example, with a, um, a, a coalition, an alliance of providers in Western PA who brought a bunch of faith based agencies across settings together to actually create jointly wraparound services. So it wasn't just one organization. It was a set of organizations that were doing everything from not just food banks, but um, delivery of food to individual homes, um, perishable and non perishable um, financial education in terms of how to get by with limited resources during this time, uh, a lot of work on mental health services. And if I were to say where they're ramping up right now, a lot of these organizations are recognizing that there's going to be, and there already is a lot of trauma and stress and post uh, post trauma distress syndrome that they are going to have to deal with. So starting to figure out how they deploy a range of mental health and counseling services to aides who often are not like on the front line in terms of even ex using those services, even if they are provided for free. So this attention to wraparound, um, I think is really critical because this was a challenging time for folks who had to deal with child care. So were there ways in which they could work together? I love this alliance concept because they brought more than one organization together to create these sort of buckets of wraparound services for the AIDS. And we're hoping, by the way, I know we're going to talk lessons learned down the road, but th th these were some of the, the techniques and the mechanisms that could be kept going post COVID. And so I think we learned a lot about efficiencies and economies of scale um, through that. Excellent. Thank you, Robin. That's quite an array of, of examples. I'm sure that it wasn't consistent throughout the country, but it's so no. heartening to know that there were at least. No, and I'm, I'm talking about the, um, you know, our, my group in particular focuses yeah. on promising our best practices. So we, we were able to identify some really good things that were going on. But I do think, I think the home care employment side is so difficult because of the fact that you've got a virtual workforce. And I, I think that COVID really underscored the challenges for employers mm -hmm. of having a virtual workforce mm. that is a disadvantaged workforce. Right. 
And, you know, what are those solutions going to be going forward? So. Robert, I'm wondering if you can um, tell us from your a little bit more national perspective about the kinds of national and state level policies uh, that seem to be most important over the last year. What what was done to really focus specifically on these workers and the challenges Absolutely. they face? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, since the beginning, we were monitoring um, federal and state policy developments and responses to COVID-19. And I would say there were a few trends that we've identified. One is that from the very beginning, the major bills that boosted funding for COVID relief, um, oftentimes direct care workers were not specified in the, that funding and the measures. Um, there was funding sometimes specified for nursing homes, less so for home and community-based services. Um, but within those funding, there weren't measures that necessarily designated parts of that funding to improve jobs for workers, to ensure that they received adequate support and supplies, or even like improved pay through hazard pay measures. As one example, it was a, a kind of an oversight or a kind of an intentional oversight maybe um, in the COVID relief funding that went out. Um, we often saw also kind of a lack of consistent information from federal and state sources about COVID-19, about the best practices. And certainly it was a time where Many people were learning about how the virus was working and and that, that guidance was shifting, but there was a clear um, in our experience, there was a, a lack of clear scientific based guidance at the time for, at the federal level um, that states could really rely on and that workers and other people in the system could feel comfortable about. Um, I think a lot has been said and written about um, uh, kind of the inadequacies of COVID related data collection and reporting requirements. And even now we have some data on you know, nursing assistants who were infected and who died, but we have no data on home care workers and the extent to which they were affected and died. And that's a major flaw in our system. We can assume that that's, that had a big impact, but we just don't have the data to report that. Um, at the state level, I think most states, um, some of the popular measures were hazard pay measures um, that were temporary in nature to increase um, wages for workers during the emergency period. Also attempts to improve child care, um, to designate more PPE and supplies. In New York State, for example, where PHI's headquarters are based um, and where Zoma works, um, we did see you know, some, some work that the state did to ensure access to PPE. We saw direct care workers designated as essential. Um, New York City in particular, which was hit very hard by the pandemic, um, developed regional enrichment centers that provided free or low-cost child care to, to low-wage workers. Um, they also designated emergency paid leave um, to cover workers who weren't eligible for federal, for federal emergency paid leave. Um, and there were efforts to, um, New York State uh, on pause included, um, instituted a 90-day moratorium on evictions. Um, and an earlier executive order prevented utilities from being turned off, recognizing that this was having a dramatic impact on lay wage workers. I will say the highest, the, the higher level theme is a theme that a lot of us who have worked in this sector and who are on this call will say about this workforce, which is that the response to COVID-19 varied across states. And that's just the reality of how this workforce is yes. governed and structured. And so um, I think it reinforced and amplified all of those challenges that we see in state to state variants. Um, certainly COVID-19 affected states differently, but the response to this workforce, I think reflects the state to state nature of the sector. <laughs> Great. All right. Um, well, Robin sort of gave us the transition to the next topic that we want to talk about. Um, she called it lessons learned. I called it silver linings. I'm just wondering if we can um, talk a little bit about um, what we learned by doing things on a somewhat ad hoc and uh, you know rapid response basis that we now looking back and say, you know, we did that on a temporary basis, but we really think that that worked pretty well, or maybe we stopped doing something that we learned we really don't need to be doing anymore. So I wonder if we can just talk a little bit about both the things that we adopted and should be continued and things that we stopped doing that we can leave aside. So maybe we'll start with Robin since she brought us to this next subject. Um, what uh, on either of these two uh, levels should we be thinking about going forward? Oops, 
uh, you're yeah, I'm on you. There you I, go. I, I think, I mean, I, I think that I love hazard pay. I love bonuses. I think they are, they were great. They were needed for this emergency, but I think this underscored the undervalue of this workforce. And I'm not just speaking from the employer perspective, because I think the employers are part of the stakeholders that are part of the problem around the solutions for all of this. But I think the question of how we, and I think right now with all the worker shortages and the challenge of this unemployment uh, payment and all of this other stuff, showing the fact that we have underpaid this workforce, I think the question is, how do we not have to continue thinking about hazard pay and bonuses when we have an emergency, but how do we translate this into what I would call a livable wage, which is, um, as you know, we you may know, we, we did a, a release a report about the impact of making care work pay and a livable wage. And there's not one single solution to it, but I think we learned something about the potential for greater compensation to actually retain staff, which I think has got to be part of this solution. We need a pipeline, but inevitably we are gonna have challenges around that. And so I think we need to have good retention strategies. And part of that is pay that is livable and that provides people with the opportunities to to grow in their jobs. So that would that's one thing. The other, as I said, was I think that our the employers that we worked with who were doing some of these wraparounds um, really realized the the value of that um, for the long haul. Some of them had been doing this before, but it certainly isn't normative. And I think thinking about models of how you can do this in a way that is gives you economies of scale, like the groups coming together to do this, giving you more purchasing power and the ability to be able to share, whether it's food, whether it's it, people who are living in food deserts, whether it's transportation for um, this frontline workforce that had some real issues around transportation. I know Zoma was on, I think you said you, I don't know if you said you were on the subway and you were afraid of that, but I mean, these are, these are serious challenges and the transportation challenges are not going to go away with COVID. So I think we've learned some things about investing in those kinds of benefits that we need to think about continuing. Um, one quick thing very quickly and then I'll stop, but I just had an example a couple of days ago. Um, one of our organizations in New York that has a mul multiple settings has created ger a geriatric um, development career program. And they were training a lot of aides. And when this pandemic hit, those aides were actually able to work in the nursing home sector where they were ser seeing serious challenges. And it underscored to me the fact that we should be looking at least exploring training for universal workers who actually are be able to be trained to the level so that they can work across these settings which would allow them to have options for working in different settings, number one, and would also be a response to some of the shortages that employers are dealing with. And actually, Washington already, already trains people up to the CNA level, but that's not true across all states. So I think we have some opportunities to think about how we deploy this workforce in a more universal way. I also think portability across states um, particularly in places like where I live, D.C., where we've got Virginia, the district, and Maryland, and this workforce is going across these boundaries all the time, but they have different training requirements <laughs> depending on where they live and where they work. So anyway, I think these are some of the things that we learned and that I think we should keep 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 going with. And just to clarify for anybody uh, in in the audience who may not have quite gotten this one little nuance, Robin, across settings, you mean between nursing homes, assisted living yes. facility, and home absolutely care, right? yes. Okay. Yes, okay. I mean that they the opportunities for this workforce to be much more flexible and nimble as we think about post COVID restructuring. I think is something that at least we should be exploring. Okay, let's um, turn now first to 
B, then Robert, and then finish up with Zoma again about what what you've learned in terms of what worked well that will be continued, um, what you stop doing that you don't need to restore. B. So one of the things that uh, that I've held over the decades I've done in this work is a lack of recognition of this workforce and the value of the workforce across public health and the healthcare sector. So I think for the first time there was this awakening and ability to really educate public health about the work of home care workers and the critical role they play out in the homes of tens of thousands of people in Washington state um, that really does create quality of life, good health, um, integration into the community and serves people in the way they want to be served. Um, and really in terms of COVID outcomes, if you look at the prevalence of COVID in the congregate care facilities compared to people in their own home, um, vastly different outcomes in terms of spread and exposure and death. And, and I think we need to really hold on to that and keep those connections with public health and the healthcare sector. My hope with that would be that home care workers become known and viewed as a critical part of a client's healthcare team for the role that they play um, and really leverage that both from a career perspective, but also a wage and visibility perspective. I think what we learned around infection control, access to PPE, um, how do you pay individuals and make sure that they have access to fit testing, that they have access to N95s, as well as all of the other protective equipment uh, for non-COVID situations. We need to keep that. We did issue hazard pay to our home care workforce of about $2.50 an hour, and that was to our self-directed workers, as well as to our home care agency workers. Um, you know, how we hold on to that hazard pay after the pandemic, you know, I would hate to see that just disappear and that people's wages go down by $2.50 an hour. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it, it's um, on us to figure out how do we, how do we continue and really leverage that to what we all want to see, which is livable wages. Um, one of the things that happened during the pandemic for us is we do offer health care um, to our self-directed workforce, but it's based on hours of work. And there was much more variability in hours of work during the pandemic than, than in outside of the pandemic, which is always variable. But the union found ways to keep people on health insurance and also to help people access um, through telehealth mental health services. And oh, you know, we want to make sure to keep that going as well. And I do believe that the ex experimentation that we did in remote work um, has a lot of promise from the perspective that there's a whole group of workers that potentially would not enter this workforce to do one on one person to person care, but potentially would access this workforce to do remote check ins, medication reminders, maybe do some laundry for clients, do some shopping for clients. And so figuring out how to keep that going and maybe specialize a workforce that really is more of a remote wrap around. Robin used that term, you know, wrap around supports to the one on one in person care that clients need um, would be something I would like to see uh, continued as well. Excellent, wonderful. Uh, Robert and then Zulma, what would you add about what needs to be continued and what should be stopped and we can leave aside? Robert? Yeah, for sure. So I would, I would certainly echo and um, reinforce the points that Robin and B made around making sure that these short term measures become long term transformations for workers. So, certainly a living wage, comprehensive benefits. Um, Robin's point about the universal worker model to work across settings and the portability across states was really critical. Um, and, you know, I, it, it, I was remembering how early on in the pandemic there were these really emotional news stories of doctors, planes of doctors flying into New York City and other cities that have been hit hard. Um, and I thought that that would be completely impossible for the direct care workforce given the state to state training requirements and other issues. And that's that's a problem, right? Um, certainly we learned um, about the value of a few approaches. One is 
you know, the need for models that are unique to local areas, such as rural models, for example, um, or populations, like, for example, um, in New Mexico, populations that are dealing with immigrants um, and people living in the border states. Um, we also see the, saw the need for data collection. Um, one of the most common questions we got at PHI in the first few months was people, you know, from certain cities or states saying that, you know, a hot spot had emerged in a certain part of the state and they wanted to know were there available workers nearby. And one of the structural challenges is that most states do not collect good data right. on direct care workers where they would be able to say, yes, there are, you know, a certain number of workers in this nearby town who can fulfill those needs. And that's a that's a lesson for us in terms of how we build that data infrastructure. Um, I love B's point about remote work and certainly virtual training as a complement to the training programs and training infrastructure that's out there and specifically training programs that are evaluated. So we know which virtual training methods work and which ones are better handled in person. Um, and I will say just again, and it's been said a few times that it is unfortunate that the hazard pay measures have for the most part expired. Um, and I think it calls to, to question sort of what are the ways in which we value and properly compensate this workforce in a system that's so reliant on Medicaid, which is already strapped for funding and is untenable in the future, right? Um, so it's a, it's a good solution for us as we talk about um, later on in this webinar. Great. Great. Zulma, what would you add about lessons and uh, that you've learned and things that you hope will continue or that don't want to be doing anymore? Right. I agree with each and every one of you. I, I think it's lovely and it's awesome, but I don't know what the hazardous pain. I'm going to start with that one. So I wish I did, but we, I don't. I just kept working and getting my minimum wage and thank God I had, to, I had a job and I was able to work. So those are the points that make me feel for every eight, you know, a little bit uncomfortable because if we're working so hard, we're not being acknowledged. And all of these great things that they're giving out that it's awesome, that makes you more motivated, it's not happening to us at all. You know, if we don't work, we don't get paid. If we get sick and we have a little bit of PTO, we're lucky to have a little bit of PTO. But if you request it for any necessity and you get sick in your home, you're not going to get paid at all. So there's a lot more going on in our program as a home health aide. That's why I feel people like you guys that are awesome, that acknowledges, that is willing to share your voice to help us out because that's what we need. We need more program, more training. And for people to know that we are essential, that we can't, we're out there working, taking care of someone else's need. It's not all about just the cleaning. It's about the communication, putting a right. smile on a patient's face being a moral support for them. A lot of patients don't have family or they live out of state. So they do rely on us. I know we have to keep it professionally, you know, client and aid. But at some point you treat them the way you want to be treated. It doesn't mean that I'm sharing anything private with them or they're with me just to make them comfortable. And during this pandemic it is a rude awakening for all of us because it's something serious that's happening. We don't know. We know how to protect ourselves. We could assume what it is, but they still haven't got it. Yes, we have a vaccine, hoping that it continue working and that it could end. I compare it to the Spanish flu. Hopefully with the flu, you know, it stopped. But it's serious when us home health phase are out there working well, with this little bit of money. We have children, we have bills to pay, and we really can't afford it. I've been working for 23 years. I don't give up. And I know God opens doors because I'm a believer, but it's been difficult to know that your pay comes and it's gone. Like they don't really care about us. And I see the system itself, but we need it. We're out there. So where does in what I, I ask myself this, when does it stop? When, I, when is somebody going to come in and say, you know what, let's recognize these ladies and gentlemen that are working. And let's respect them, like if they're working in a nursing home, like if they're working in a hospital, because it's a home base. I could work in a nursing home or a hospital. But working in a home base, it's a lot of work. But these people need the attention and need the help. They need us and we need them. So it's a two-way street. But I don't think the system is treating us as a two-way street. We're all the way in the bottom of the list. And it's sad. And if so, I can just express myself for every other A, one person that listens, my job is done. That's all I can do. 
Well, we so appreciate the fact that you are here to share that experience. I want to emphasize, Zulma, that what you said is a reminder to all of us that many of the good examples that we're talking about today were far from widespread or universal, didn't touch a lot of people, um, a lot of folks in your situation that they should have. But I also want to say that we are now at a point where we really want to segue in and, and switch to the solutions that are going to solve the problems that you've been dealing with. Um, it is very exciting to see that in just in the last couple of months that new federal funds have recently become available to expand access to home and community based services for older adults and people with disabilities. For example, um, up to 12 billion dollars is available through the American Rescue Plan Act. Now that's the stimulus law that, that was signed by President Biden in March. And the, uh, I don't know, 35 or so states that continue to operate money follows the person programs that help people in institutions go back home uh, or, or to a, a residential um, situation in the community can receive up to $5 million grants to support further efforts to rebalance their system to offer more alternatives to institutions. And then most interesting and exciting is the Biden administration's proposed $2 trillion American jobs plan, which includes 400 billion in new funding for HCBS of a home and community based services. If it gets passed, of course, I don't want to. Uh, jump to conclusions there, but it is still extraordinarily um, promising that we've never really even seen numbers like this before. So. I guess let's segue to our last question before we um, close out. Um, let's start with um, B in this case. How can states make best use of these current new federal funds, those that I talked about before in the American Rescue Plan Act um, or in Money Follows the Person? And what are some of the things that Washington State is thinking about doing with these funds? And then um, we'll follow on with Zulma to continue thinking about what the best way is to invest these new funds and then Robert and finish up with Robin. So B, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so I do think it's a super exciting time. Um, we've, you know, to have the opportunity to really think about smart investments, you know, it is a great place to be. I would say, though, that it's challenging for states when there is short term funding available. Um, you know, you want to be careful about creating bow waves, or at least that's where legislative bodies often are, um, you know, creating, um, you know, vendor rate increases or wage increases that um, they'll have to figure out how to keep going. Uh, with general fund state once the federal funds goes away. So right now with the 10% FMAP, it's great news that we have until March of 2023 to be able to make those investments. And, you know, we have done things like we have extended the um, hazard pay through the end of this calendar year. We've also used some of the funding to fund base wage increases through the collective bargaining agreement for workers, both in adult family homes, as well as in uh, self-directed and home care agencies. Um, we've done some investments through the money follows the person uh, around workforce development. So we've created a um, website, uh, WashingtonCareCareers.org, where folks can go to really learn about the direct care workforce, both home care aides and CNA, certified nursing assistants to learn about those jobs, learn about the settings, how do you become qualified, and where do you find the jobs. Um, we're doing a lot of work with workforce boards, um, trying to help them understand the criticality of this workforce, get their help in um, recruitment and retention efforts, which is a challenge because of the livable wage issue. Um, and, you know, it's hard to get the attention of the workforce boards to prioritize home care. Um, we, uh, have created a 90 hour high school course um, where folks can take that course and they get high school credits in addition to the credits needed to become a certified home care aide. They also have a pay uh, internship and a long term care setting. Uh, we have one high school that's offering that program and we're we're trying to expand that program out. It's very important for um, people coming into the field to have ways to advance not, you know, advance in their work as a home care aide, 
Um, many people do make a career out of being a home care aide and, and they gain skills and competencies that, that need to be utilized for more complex clients um, that need their services. We also want to make sure that people understand that the skills and competencies that they gain um, can be used in healthcare fields, social services fields, you know, those types of things. So really doing that education. Robert pointed out the problem that we have with data. Um, we, we need to make some investments in how do we gather good actionable data and how do we use that data to better understand the effectiveness of the recruitment and retention strategies that we do put in place. So I think that there's lots of ways to use that funding. Our legislature has appropriated about 377 million of the um, a, a wrap funds and there's another 143 that uh, will work with them when they come back into town in January to appropriate. That's very encouraging and a lot of really good and seemingly very useful ideas. I'd like, Silma, if you could tell the New York legislature and the state Medicaid agency how they should spend these funds, what would you say? <laughs> I would say they were better paid and more <laughs> training, more programming, more programs. And um, I know a lot of age, and I tell you really briefly, that have only been training for two weeks and they put them in the field. There's not enough training. For an example, cooperative home care gave us four weeks and mm -hmm. we take two state tests before we become certified with a license. And we take annual competency and we do a lot of in-service. Even now, with the situation that we have, they give a webinar, the union also gives us webinar. So it keeps us going and it keeps us um, fresh. And what we have to do is like a reminder of what we do and what we can do. And overall, Prior to our conversation earlier, why we should keep going is things that we didn't, that we knew, but we didn't continue doing. And it's more the communication, the compassion that we have for one another now in this time of need. And I think those things should go long term because it's actually Great. awesome. Great. So going back, I wish that they'll give us higher pay and <laughs> more programming. <laughs> You know, we yeah. need it. We need right. it. Right, right, right. That's great. Robert. For all home care workers. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. Robert, uh, what are your priorities for these new federal funds? How do you think they can be best invested? Um, I think they can be used for a number of, of benefits and needs. I mean, certainly raising wages overall. Um, the American Rescue Plan money could be used to implement hazard pay, shift differential pay or retention bonuses. It can be used to launch new recruitment programs and pipelines, strengthening training and credentialing systems, also establishing, establishing matching service registries, which are online portals where workers and consumers can find each other. Um, and with the American Rescue Plan funding in particular, um, I think it's important that states begin planning for the impact that it'll have on their state budgets and for long-term sustainability so that when the money runs out that these benefits don't go away and we see these short-term transformations go away. Um, I do hope that the American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan also pass and that they boost funding for improving home care wages, uh, for a wide range of workforce development programs, and for supports like child care. Also, there's a, the direct creation advancement and retention of employment opportunity act or the direct care opportunity act if it were to pass it would invest more than 1 billion dollars over 5 years in workforce interventions that improve training would improve recruitment retention and advancement um beyond that the one point i would add is that i do think we need more federal support for immigrants uh, who are a big part of the direct care workforce and of the long term care and health sectors um and there are ways in which federal leaders can create pathways to citizenship, can boost programs that recruit immigrants from abroad to build a pipeline, and also training programs that support immigrants who are already in this country and who are already um, in this sector. Um, that's a, a key piece of making sure this workforce is as strong as possible. Excellent. And Robin, any further ideas, thoughts? I'm sure you have <laughs> a few. I, I think I agree with everybody. Um, and in fact, I mean, I, I do worry about um, influxes of federal monies that are, <clears throat> that are short term because I, what, what I, I don't want to see us set up expectations that money is used and then that's the end of it. I mean, that, that's how I always feel about wage pass throughs where we've gotten, 
you know, additional monies to go directly to into the AIDS pockets, and but it's not built into the infrastructure. So I, I think Robert's admonition about at least being thoughtful about what, is, what does this mean for your ongoing budgets at the state level, I think is, is going to be really important. Right. The other thing is, is that it occurred to me that we could be thinking about using some of this money for, I don't know even if we could do it, but using it for some demonstration activity. For example, we are really interested in cluster care, home care models, where, for example, in affordable housing, where you have a lot of low income older adults living, that you could cluster an aid um, rather than the way that it's distributed right now, where there's a certain amount of hours per aid time. And rather than doing that, actually cluster aid services so that aids could actually serve more people with less aids so that you actually could address some of the shortage issues. But at the same time, you are actually titrating the aid need, the needs of individuals to the aids time. And you know there's choice issues there because you're going to have you're going to limit the options of older adults to certain organizations or certain aids. But the truth of the matter is most of these lower income older adults don't have a whole lot of choice anyway. And I think it's an opportunity for us to look at how do we expand home and community based services and aid services in a way that might fit person centered care more more appropriately. So. I'd like us to look at some innovation. Um, and I know there's also some innovation dollars that the states are, um, are going to be uh, that, that are going to be available to states to think about how maybe we develop some new ways of I'd love to see more worker co-ops. Um, you know, and we've tried for so many years to take that co-op in the Bronx and move it out. It's been really, really difficult, particularly because of so many of, of these programs are dependent on Medicaid. But worker co-ops where workers own part of the solution is an incredible model. So how do we think about both the investment of some of this money, looking at innovation, and then thinking about how we sustain that for the long term? Okay, uh, this has been a very comprehensive and wide ranging conversation. Um, we've gotten many, many questions from our audience and we got many questions from them in advance as well. So trying to um, put those all together in a way that can be answered in the remaining 20 minutes or so of the time we have together is a bit of a challenge. Uh, but let me take a, a stab um, at at least summarizing what we got in advance and then moving to a couple of uh, questions we got from uh, participants during the call. So first and foremost, on the minds of our participants, even before they came here, um, were wages and benefits. We've talked a lot during this conversation about wages and benefits. So some of the questions that we got, for example, were just how much is needed to increase um, the number of people that we're recruiting and retaining, reducing turnover. And where will the funds come from? We talked a little bit about some new temporary funds, but um, who's going to cover those costs in the long term? Um, and if, for example, states take advantage of new federal funds to increase Medicaid reimbursement rates, how can they ensure that agencies are going to pass those dollars along? to ensure that those wage increases reach the workers. Um, and just a one or two, uh, I just wanted to, to add a couple of other direct quotes, direct questions that we got, um, just to give a flavor for some of the questions. Because state Medicaid benchmark rates are so low, we can only pay our direct support um, professionals the local minimum wage um, and so many of these workers work at more than one job to afford to live. How can we ensure livable wages for direct support professionals, both to build a skilled workforce and also to avoid the massive workload and burden staff take on with multiple jobs? And then uh, another just example of the same wages and benefits issue. Another uh, participant said, how can we expect people to take a job? With this level of responsibility for someone's life, when we cannot pay more than what they would make stocking shelves at Target or Walmart. 
So with that, I mean, and there were many, there literally, there were probably dozens and dozens more, but along the same line. So I know we talked a lot, we've all agreed that it's important to increase wages and benefits. We've talked about at least temporary hazard pay increases and the potential of new federal funds to, to keep some of those higher wages uh, and benefits going at least for the short term but just wanted to think because this is really the the crux of our question today how do we scale up and sustain these wage and benefit improvements so anyone want to start <laughs> taking on that difficult question i'm happy to take a first stab at it um no okay. I I'll be curious to hear other people's thoughts as well. I mean, two, two points that I think we would advocate for, and this is absolutely the time for us to advocate for it at the federal level. Um, one is that I think it's time for us to develop at the national level, a national compensation strategy to improve wages for all direct care workers. And here we would argue because this is a workforce that covers a variety of agencies from CMS to ACL, HRSA, DOL, and others, that they should really coordinate and develop a national compensation strategy that addresses specifically a living wage, which is a formula that takes into account local cost of living and the wide range of needs that, that all of us have. But it would also look at specific recommendations on how states should set their Medicaid rates to ensure competitive wages and benefits for workers. It should consider both traditional Medicaid and also managed care contacts within long-term care. Um, and it should consider things like full-time scheduling barriers. Uh, too often workers aren't able to attain full-time hours. Um, benefit cliffs and benefit plateaus, which is the phenomenon that oftentimes workers will see their total compensation drop once they work because of a decrease in public benefits once they work past a certain number of hours, right? Right? And all of these should be translated into regulations for the rate setting and enforcement process at the state level. Now, that's a hefty undertaking. So I say I cover it in broad terms, but I do think it's time for us to think about kind of bringing the agencies together and thinking about a strategy that addresses all and many more complexities. So. The federal agencies you're thinking about primarily. That's an important, important uh First step, I would think. I'm not even sure if it's been done at all. So I think that's an excellent suggestion. Other thoughts about addressing long term increases in wages and benefits for the direct care workforce. Well, at the risk of alienating my entire membership, um, which is always the challenge for me because I'm a, you know, I run our research group, but we also represent a lot of providers who, who argue that if we had at least had better, more more reasonable Medicaid rates, that this would help solve some of the problem. And I actually believe that it will, it won't solve all of the problem, but I think this is a heavily, this is a workforce heavily dominated by Medicaid payments. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I, I think this is, a, this is a public societal concern because Robert, even if we were to have this work done at the federal level, you still we still have to get the money. And this means that we have to look at what is the distribution of dollars out there now? Is it is it being distri distributed equitably across various staff within our sector? And then what new money do we need to actually make this happen in a sustainable way? And how do we raise that? I mean, do we use the T word? I mean, is there, do we, a lot of, I mean, livable wage is a market is a market phenomenon. It's not a federal phenomenon because a livable wage in where I live is not the same as a livable wage in a small town in Washington state. So um, what about the thinking about the use of local referenda uh, that actually, or local levies? You know, I go back to my wonderful example of years of, of the Area Agency on Aging in Southwest uh, Ohio raised millions and millions of dollars with local levies for aging services. Uh, because the people were committed to it. And this was a very conservative county that they raised this money in. So we have got to get our consumers to understand what these costs are. This is, this is Medicaid cannot raise their rates without somehow figuring out how, where that money is going to come from. And part of that has got to be a, the political will of people to say, we want our professionals who are caring for us 
to have really good competency-based training, and then we want them paid to that level of competence. And so it, it's not an easy solution, but I think we have to start to get the consumer communities together with all of us to say, we got to figure this out. I believe there's a lot of room for some redistribution of dollars already in the system, but I also think we need new money. And, you know, we're not going to get manna from heaven. So we have to figure that out and get the population that's being served behind us to say, you know, we're all in this together. Right, right, right. Great. Um, I'm going to go on to the next set of questions unless Zulma or B have anything to add here about really dealing with the, the biggest question of, of how do we get the money for raising wages and benefits? B, Zulma? I would just add, you know, because we're so heavily reliant on Medicaid and because Medicaid is a shared state federal responsibility, mm -hmm. you have to figure out how to either increase the federal money um, you know, to help states do that and or get your legislative bodies to really understand, you know, um, the, the importance of the work and, and the cost of the turnover associated um, on the lives of people and, and on the workforce as well. Um, and I think that, as Robin said, it's not just the legislators, the, the public has to demand it in order yeah. for the legislators to actually pass yeah. budgets I mean, and support I it. I was actually, I did a presentation for Western state legislators on this workforce. And I talked to the people who are in the appropriations committees, not the, not the people who were on the services committees. These people were clueless about what Medicaid even pays for. And all of these people were over 65. And I'm like, what this, you know, the, the lack of education and knowledge about where our dollars are going, um, even among those legislators, was just a, amazing to me. So I, I do think we need a lot of education. Now that's not going to ultimately say, you know, have people say, okay, now we got to pay for this. But at least it opens the doors to people recognizing. I mean, I don't want us to be compared to a target. Um, I don't. I don't want Zoma compared to a target person, a person working in Target. Zoma is a highly, everybody has a qualified job, but she's a professional who's taking care of people's lives, life and death issues here. So that's the kind of information that I think we need to get out there. Right. And Deborah, I, you know, we've done some modeling. If we were going to try to move the wage to a $20 an hour wage, which probably isn't enough in some of our geographic areas like Seattle, mm -hmm. um, it's $1 billion a year that we would have to raise to raise, you know, salaries across across our entire settings to $20 an hour for direct care workers. Right. So it's a right. lot of money. Yeah, it's sticker shock, I think, for legislators mm -hmm. to really understand what's going on here. Yep. Yep. Um, let me move on. I'm conscious of the time here. There, there's so many different questions. The next most popular set of questions was beyond wages and benefits. Are there, I mean, you know, we've got some urgent, urgent needs to fill right now until we're able to do the kind of education and advocacy and planning that we just talked about. What can we do now, um, you know, to recruit and retain workers um, without significantly, at least, raising wages and benefits, which can be difficult or sometimes impossible for agencies that just don't have the wherewithal to do so. Um, and again, just a couple of quick quotes uh, from the questions that we got. We've tried everything from sign on and referral bonuses to increase wages to the extent we can under Medicaid to offering special assistance like childcare resources, gift cards, paying for kids school supplies. And we're still struggling to find enough people to fill current vacancies. So I guess the question is, what else can we do that's really important that will make a difference? Before, or in addition to increasing wages and benefits. Any thoughts or ideas? Well, I have, I have a couple of things to say. Okay, 1 is, even though I think we have a worker shortage. We still have a lot of, we have a lot of turnover in our sector. And so, to me, retention. Is a really important thing to focus on and we have some things that we know work. 
including better supervisor um, management and oversight of aides in the home mm -hmm. and support that helps them, including peer mentoring. In fact, um, better supervision, supervisors and peer mentoring in home care empirically has been demonstrated to affect turnover. So if we were to simultaneously, as we're working on these other things, invest in the workplace of home care, how do we ensure that this workforce that is with us is, is managed and supported and coached and nurtured and has peer mentors to help them through, at least if we, if we make some inroads in stopping the turnover we have retained, which means we have less of a requirement to, to recruit. So a good retention strategy is not the same as a recruitment strategy. And I think we, that organizations need to understand that. Um, the second thing is as why I argued for cluster care, because I think the more that we can use AIDS more creatively, the less demand we will have in the short term for as much supply. The third is Leading Age has put together an idea around a guest worker program, which would actually be, could be short term, could become a more long term phenomenon, but actually bringing workers in from other countries. Now, COVID may have, you know, put some real damper on that, but creating a short term guest worker program like they have in, uh, in Israel and a few other countries where you bring workers in, they get well trained, they have human rights. Um, wrapped around them so there's no exploitation. You bring them in for five years, let's say, and you identify real worker shortage areas. I mean, clearly we've got that in rural communities around the country, right. but you could target these um, foreign worker programs. You'd have to expedite it, which is like really very difficult in the United States with all of our immigration yes. policies, but that might be a short-term fix for some, some of our challenges. Right. And let me just press you just a little bit, Rob, and I, we talked about uh, one of the themes of this webinar is evidence based strategies. Is there good evidence that some of the recruitment and training strategies that you t just talked about really do reduce? Yes, turnover? yes, okay. we have That's evidence fine. of it. And in fact, we're going back, um, Deborah, to our better jobs, better care. Um, materials that we did yes. 15 years ago, because That's we right. actually have a whole evidence-based piece on that. And those those strategies, which by the way, we did together with PHI, yes. um, are the same as they were 15 years ago. I mean, the, the, a lot of this is behavioral change and investment in the workplace. Yes. So, um, but they do have evidence behind them. Okay. I'm, I knew they did. I just wanted to make sure that our audience understood it. In fact, I wanted to just make sure that uh, as we're in our closing 10 minutes here, people know that there's a ton of information at leadingage.org, uh, at PHI. Um, Washington State has a tremendous number of useful resources. Um, so I just wanted to know that we've got some, that people looking for that evidence, uh, we can, you can start here and there's many other places to find it and that we can help you find more. So um, with that, let me just continue to see if there's any other comments about um, beyond wages and benefits from our other panelists that you wanted to talk about or other evidence-based policies that you want to make sure our audience comes away with. If I could add a, a few points, um, I think one is um, looking at innovations that address scheduling challenges. Um, there are innovations out there where people who have really figured out how to manage a complicated schedule through technology and how to make sure that you're able to meet all your clients' needs, but also kind of your business goals, right? Um, we have seen uh, an interest in innovation funds at the policy level. Can states or the federal government kind of designate a pot of funding that would go specifically to innovating in recruitment and retention and evaluation so that we get a good sense of what works and what doesn't. Um, certainly recruiting new populations, so to speak, right? More men or more younger people and what are the specific strategies that need to to be employed to address that and supporting existing subgroups within the direct care workforce 
workers that have unique needs, like older workers, for example, may have may require specific supports. Immigrant workers require supports. LGBT workers may have life challenges, etc. Um, because that oftentimes the life challenges that workers are facing can be as profound in terms of their ability to be present on the job, and that's that's part of the retention piece as well. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Zulma, anything else that you wanted to say about, you know, besides the importance of getting a living wage and benefits that you think is really important for you and your coworkers that that really help to keep you on the job and keep you motivated and coming back to work every day? Yes, I must agree with um, Robin when she mentioned peer mentors because mm -hmm. peer mentors come in and they help you, they reassure you, they'll guide you. And it's about behavior. She's absolutely correct. So that's a very good point. That should come back because we need that. It's very important. But with everything else, you guys have done a great job. I'm <laughs> happy. I learn. I'm learning from you guys. And I agree. I agree. I know it takes a team to do this, but let's just hope that we be heard so this can be accomplished. Okay. Um, I've got one more question that. Um, it's a little bit off topic. We haven't really dealt with it, but I didn't want to leave without at least acknowledging that it does have a role. We had a few questions about the role of te technology in filling worker shortages. I know we all understand that so much of this work is hands on care, but I'm just wondering if you have any comments about assistive technology or communication technology or other. We talked a little bit B before about how we learned so much about the importance of communication with workers, but also connecting people to um, to each other for resource and support. So just wanted to open it up to our panelists to see if you have any comments about the role of either assistive technology or communication technology in addressing our, our issues here. I would just say that assistive technology from a consumer perspective um, can be a great wraparound service to the in person personal care services that are happening in the home. We have certainly um, seen lots of examples where it helps with social isolation, um, both from the worker perspective, but also the consumer perspective that, um, you know, there are apps out there that can really help clients really map maximize their independence and mm -hmm. um, use use their personal care in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. um, for, from a worker perspective, I think keeping connected with each other, um, you know, how do we use the information? I, what I say is, you know, for home care workers, there's no other worker that is with a client for 20 hours a week. Or, or sometimes it's 24 seven. So they are in the best position to observe changes to, uh -huh. to help support behaviors that, that result in positive, you know, health outcomes and, and technology can be a huge piece of that in terms of communicating as a client is comfortable um, with the healthcare delivery team. And we need to really figure out ways to maximize and leverage those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Great. Other quick thoughts on the role of technology. And how it can yeah. help or yeah i mean i i did want to i think b was really alluding to the role of the aid as a t as a team member mm -hmm. um i think we have a lot to learn about how we build aids in as equitable team members uh, actually there was a demonstration in new york city that um was very effective but um didn't actually have a good enough evaluation to actually move it forward but where aides are involved, because they see everything, if they had the technology, particularly the data platform, to be able to mm -hmm. enter all of this information That's and right. actually have it shared in real time with the rest of that team, they start to become part of the solution. They already are part of the solution, but they're acknowledged as part of that solution. I think that is both a retention strategy, but quite honestly, if you think about young people getting into this field who are very facile with their PDAs and everything else, that's going to be what's attractive to them, that they can actually use those tools to share information and be part of a team effort. So I think there's a lot of room to use the, the low hanging fruit technology. I don't think we're going to see robots replacing of uh, AIDS anytime soon. I think there are probably things that, that a robot can do today. 
Um, but I do think that, you know, there is a room for thinking about the complementarity of technologies with human resources. And that's just going to have to happen over time. But right now, this notion that we can solve this with robots, if Japan could have solved it with robots, they would have done it. <laughs> and they're actually going in the opposite direction. So, you know, I, I'm I'm the Luddite in the group around technology, but in this area that's so human resource intensive, we have to be thinking about technology that helps the aid yep. and helps yep. the family. And in the, some cases, it is the, fa in many cases, it's the family member. So what is that's helping right. that family member? That's right. And we could have a whole other webinar just focus on support for family caregivers as well. We have unfortunately have reached the limit of our time together here today. I want to extend a, just a deep and sincere thanks to our panelists. I think this was a terrific conversation, a lot of great ideas. There are still enormous challenges here, but we also have some glimmer of hope that there are solutions on the horizon. And I think that's important that we all remember that this is not unsolvable and we can, we can work together to solve some of these problems. So again, on behalf of Mathematica and the Center for Studying Disability Policy, let me thank you and all of our participants today. We thank you for your attendance and um, hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks again. Thank <laughs> you.